So every so often when we're exploring a classic episode, we run into something that is true, uh, but unfortunately prescient. And folks, this week we're sharing with you our episode called Big Data and You. <laughs> it kind of makes me think of like an after school special on like, you know, how to like protect yourself against big data. It's not too far off from what it is. Well, it's it's weird to think this was put out originally six years ago, I believe. And just how much the landscape has changed since then. It hasn't really changed. It's these big data has just gotten stronger, basically. And there are several companies that have just kind of uh, strengthened their positions. Yeah, and there's there's no turning back the clock on this, but on one positive note, a sorely needed positive note, more people are aware of the dangers of this sort of uh, ubiquitous observation and surveillance and how it can be used to nudge your decisions. It's gone past, by the way, figuring out who might want to buy uh, some new Ray Bans or something. This is oh yeah. This is about making people do things they may not have ordinarily done at this point. But if you have someone that in your life that you feel like needs uh, to know a little bit more about the basics of what people mean when they say big data, this is the episode for you. It also goes into the idea that if you don't know what the product is, it's probably you. So, without further ado. Turn your ad trackers on and tune in to this classic episode. Disagree. Turn your phones off. Even if you're listening to this on your phone, just go ahead and turn it off right now. Don't even listen. Just Don't drop it listen. in. Just drop it into a bucket of water. To go safer that way. Cover ups. History is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. And I'm Ben. We're here with our super producer, Noel, which makes this... Stuff they Moog want you to know. Close. Not quite there. Oh, you're right. I said something wrong. I can't, <laughs> I can't figure out what it was. Uh, yeah, we're pretty excited about this new gadget, or I guess new to us gadget that's here in the studio today. Matt, do you want to tell everybody a little bit about it? It's just an, a couple old school synthesizers from the 70s and 80s, and hopefully Noel's going to be bringing those into the mix maybe on this show maybe not i don't know i don't know he looks like he could go either way so let's start today's episode with an anecdote uh that you may have heard if you watched our video series earlier this week 2012 minnesota this family starts getting ads from target you know every people get ads from yeah, target we all do i get them right you're used to it it happens but this time something's different. They've received ads before, but this time something's off. The ads are for stuff like diapers, and strollers, and baby lotion and stuff. You get the idea. Like for someone who's expecting lovely thing to be, but there's a catch here. Nobody at that house is expecting. So the dad is livid and the especially about the ads addressed specifically to his teenage daughter. That's the whole point. Still it's in high school. Addressed to his high school age daughter. Yeah. Yep, and uh, so he goes to Target in person on uh, an, in some beast mode, WTF <laughs> kind of stuff, uh, trending toward WWE possibly. Uh, when he goes back, has a chat with his daughter, comes back to Target and says, oh, yeah, she's expecting in August. Whoops, on all accounts. This comes to us through a New York Times piece that was published on February 19th, 2012, about how obsessively uh, companies track your shopping habits and every little piece of uh, information they can about you to hopefully make you more likely to buy something. And the guy who was interviewed... Uh, the, a statistics man working for Target interviewed in this New York Times article was shut down after he mentioned this uh, because what we're talking about is something that many, many companies do but is incredibly controversial, and that is big data. Yeah, it's something that – it's not necessarily something they don't want you to know, but they don't want you to know about it. Like, well, it's kind of a known thing now that you are being tracked in all these different ways and looked at 
Uh, but this is something that we feel you should know more about. Right. Yeah. It's uh, something that it's it's strange that you say it's not necessarily something they don't want you to know because they certainly don't want other people to know the techniques used to gather this information. Absolutely. They they might not want you to know some of the things that we can't tell you because we don't know. Right. Because uh, the data sets themselves are important, but what may be even more important and even more secretive would be the techniques used to parse and analyze this information. Right. Well, and even where they're getting some of this data from. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, so what what is big data if we have to define it? It's not like – it's not the same thing as uh, – Big agribusiness or, or no. big bell or something. <laughs> big pomegranate. Right. Uh, no, big data is just, as a definition, any extremely large data set uh, or data sets that can be analyzed, usually now in the modern day computationally is the only way to even get your, you know, wrap your head around it. Uh-huh. Um, to reveal patterns and trends, uh, all kinds of associations, especially those relating to human behavior and or the interactions between humans. So, for instance, this w- big data would not be the GPS of one person. It would be the GPS of a city or people who all work at a large company. Or, yeah, one, com- one GPS company's data. Yeah. Yeah, or exactly. yeah, but I love the idea of the GPS information of one like certain area and just all of that data stacked vertically together from everyone that's been in that area. Right, there are different ways to parse this. Uh this big data usually uh includes sets that are so large they're beyond the ability of typical software tools. Like you couldn't for instance just take uh, some some data set that is big data size and put it in an Excel spreadsheet or on a Google Drive. No, right? no, there's no way. And if you did, it would be the largest file in the history of Excel. So when we look at the range of this, we also know that the size of data is a constantly moving target because uh, it seems that there's just more and more and more out there. Uh, there's a really weird statistic here somewhere that I think is like 90% of all the data that exists was made in the last 20 or 10 years or something. Oh, absolutely. It's exponential. And that's mm-hmm. one of the things we're going to talk about here, just the, the number of devices that collect data or that you can collect data upon yeah. and just everything that's connected to the Internet nowadays. Mm-hmm. It's insane. And again, yeah. it, it doesn't go away. Once, no. it, once you have a data set, it's not like it's irrelevant. You're still going to need that maybe for future, you know, whatever endeavors that you're going to do as a big business. Right. For gamers, uh, this would be sort of the equivalent of an inventory that doesn't register weight. <laughs> how uh, role-playing games turn, and you're more familiar with this than I am, how role-playing games turn so many people into hoarders. Yeah. Uh, we are data hoarders as well, like the NSA clearly is. Oh, yeah. Uh, So what we'll do is we'll walk through some history of big data, and then we'll also talk about some of the controversy surrounding it, the ways it could be used, some of the conspiracies, theoretical and factual, about this practice. So uh, one way that one way, there's a group called Meta Group or Gartner. Uh, they they uh, have an analyst there named Doug Laney, and he said one great way to measure big data would be in the three Vs. That would be increasing volume, uh, just how much data you have, mm-hmm. uh, the velocity of the data, the speed of the in and out, right, and the variety, the type of stuff. Where is it coming from? So not just all homogenous GPS records, but also like what's something else people would collect. Well, another set of data that's really interesting to look at when when combined with GPS data are phone records. That's uh, always a fun thing. Um, and these these three V's that you're mentioning, this is a, now a, an industry standard. The way the whole industry looks at big data, with what is it? Volume, velocity. What was the third one? Uh, that's volume, velocity, and variety. So variety. Uh, GPS and phone records would be something that, that helps you flesh out a virtual persona, but it comes from the, the same device probably for most people. Ah, true. So another thing that would be more varied would be stuff like medical records, stuff like ah. recent purchases on your financial records. So you could parse it down to uh, 
people who, let's get a little bit dark with it, you could parse it down to uh, some, we have these four sets of data about this person, right? So we know that uh, once every week or something, they go to a clinic, right? Mm -hmm. specializes in some kind of treatment, right? And then we know that through their medical records that they have some kind of uh, debilitating condition. And then we see that one of their recent purchases is uh, a skydiving suit. So we have built this picture with just very little information (sighs) about someone who probably has a terminal disease and wants to skydive because it was on their bucket list. And now we know exactly the kind of things to sell to this person. And we know exactly the kind of things to sell, which is frightening. Mm -hmm. Uh, So this is, I mean, this is an example that you and I just made up now, right, Matt? This is not, we we don't know anyone that this has happened to. So this is a new information age. It's tough to stress how quickly personal privacy has eroded, right? Um, Mm -hmm. And we, the people of the information age, have committed, um, have, have lost our privacy due to acts of negligence, not due to aggressively uh, rooting for this loss of privacy. It's just who reads terms and conditions, right? Who has oh, the time? Yeah. yeah, and we're all very happy about some of the things that providing this type of data gives to us. The GPS thing alone, I think, is a massive... I mean, a lot of people would... I don't. I can't speak for everyone, but for myself, to have the ability to use a GPS when I'm out on the road somewhere yeah. instead of having to look at a physical map is one of those things where... Uh, sometimes I just go, you know what, screw it. Turn on my GPS on. I need it. Right. And even if they know that this yeah. is where. Oh, highly aware yeah. of th- that this is being tracked. But, right. But there's also, there's such a um, a sort of narcissism in paranoia. This idea that, yes, uh, of course they care where I get my pickles. <laughs> of course, of course, someone does. And don't get me wrong. I mean, sure, grocery stores for sure do. Every time you yes. swipe a loyalty card, you are generating more information for them to uh, target ads toward you, which we'll talk about whether or not that is, you know, morally wrong or ethically sticky or whatever. Or uh, if you would, would someone want that? Like, right. are there people out there that want Kroger to know exactly what they order so they can just say, hey, here's all the things that you want and here are the coupons? Right. there, And there are some people. I would definitely take some coupons for things. But also, this is, okay, this is so unrelated. <laughs> this is a, a side conspiracy here, Matt. Uh, so you and I are just old enough to remember before these loyalty cards came out everywhere, right? Oh, yeah. When I was in college, they didn't exist. So – the way that they were instituted was that uh, for for all the young guns out there, the way that these cards were instituted was at first they gave you discounts on things, mm-hmm. right? But one of the conspiracies that I've heard is that this uh, artificial price shenaniganing, if I can make up the word, it, uh, ultimately became something where having the card – didn't really get you a discount. It just got you the you get the the regular price. The regular price. Yes. Then so the money that they're making on mm-hmm. top of selling your information to third parties, CVS is like, yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's a, and and so you're you're being penalized. At least this theory goes for not participating in this program, and that's because again, the overwhelming majority of companies. Uh, don't just do this. They do this with relish, and it is profitable, but it is a very, very old idea. Is that correct? I have to say, this. Yeah. here's the worst news about that whole situation. What's that? Even if you go somewhere and shop, uh, I'm just going to use an example that I'm aware of, like Publix, that I don't have a loyalty card for, and I don't know that you can get one. Maybe you can now, but and you, you try and save money there. Sure. If you pay with a card of any type. Ah, yes. Then that stuff's being tracked maybe by a separate company, a third party, or maybe just your credit card company. But the same thing is happening. And we'll see a couple of different reasons that this happens, you know, or, or a couple different uh, motivations for this collection. Sure. But let's walk through the history first. Okay, so this is not a new thing, uh, trying to track data, trying to understand numbers about things that are happening in the world around you it goes back 7,000 years to something that we've mentioned before in uh, Mesopotamia during the the birth of agriculture. Uh-huh. 
when you had to keep track of seeds, you had to keep track of crops and soil, just everything. You needed to know data about the ground and the plants that you're trying to put in there. So, yeah. So, for example, uh, there's an accounting system that goes in to monitor the growth of a, I don't know, uh, uh, an olive uh, sure. An olive tree, right? And so, um, you know, some farmer named uh, John Stamos, a very common name in Mesopotamia at the time, I imagine. Uh, this farmer, John Stamos, has uh, a bunch of olives, and they have to have a way to track year over year the performance of that crop, right? Mm-hmm. So this is when they begin saying, okay, you know, John Stamos has X amount of trees. They yield Y amount of um, olives each year. This is what we can expect. This is what we can expect. This is what we can bet against. This is what we can sell in advance before it's made. Then you get into, uh, we're going to jump forward pretty far here, all the way to 1663. Nothing else happened. Yeah, zero. (laughs) Nothing between 7,000 years ago and 1663. Let's just say improvements uh, are being incrementally, you know, are happening up until this point. But then uh, the next big change is 1663 when John Grant, uh, I think that's how you correctly spell it, Grant, Uh uh, very British, uh, he recorded and examined information about mortality rates because the bubonic plague was just ravaging just the entire area at the time. And he decided he wanted to know more information about like how what is happening here exactly, how many people are getting affected, why are they getting affected. Let's get information and we can mm-hmm. start solving this. Yeah. And that sounds that sounds sensible. It's the least you could do, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, we I don't know, have we ever talked on this show about just how profoundly the plague or the series of things known as the plague changed the world? No, I, I've listened to a little too much Stuff You Missed in History class about it, so the information sometimes gets muddled between what we've talked about and mm. what I've just heard. These plagues have uh, played such a profound role in uh, the global evolution of the human species. Mm-hmm. It's just crazy. It's the kind of stuff you would want to keep track on. So this guy, uh, John Grant, becomes... Uh, the father of statistics, or he's considered that because he does the first statistical data analysis that we have recordings of. Uh, and he has a book about it called Natural and Political Observations Made Upon the Bills of Mortality. Just kind of a dry name, right? <laughs> but it's, it's not a feel good subject. And people continue to work off this statistical analysis. Mm-hmm. So let's fast forward to the 20th century. Okay. So we're going to fast forward all the way to 1887. This is when uh, the modern, the age of modern data, modern data is uh, when it is born. Uh So this gentleman named Herman Hollerith invented a computing machine that could read these holes, uh, punched holes in cards, the paper cards, in order to organize census data. And this is a huge change because you have to imagine just collecting data of going door to door, getting information, then trying to compile that just with humans yeah. in rooms. How could we do that? It was taking uh, – so they would do one one census every 10 years, I believe, mm-hmm. at the time. And it was taking almost nine years before you would get the results from the census of the, pre- the previous census. Yeah. So it was almost – I don't not worthless, but it would just felt like they were running backwards almost. Right. Yeah. They had they had a data set that would be when it was finally complete, useful for a little less than a year. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, the first data processing machine appeared in 1943. Uh, this was, of course, it came out of war. A lot of uh, technological innovations mm-hmm. come out of war, uh, and it was meant to decipher codes from the Nationalist Socialists or the Nazis. Uh, this thing was named Colossus, which is a pretty cool name, and they would intercept messages, they would feed things to Colossus, and would search for patterns in these characters, and it, it worked pretty quickly. Yeah, it would go 5,000 characters per second, which is huge. It reduced the time from weeks Two hours. And let's stroll through some other stuff here. Just kind of laundry list it so we can get to the good stuff. Uh, 1952, everybody's favorite, the NSA, the National Security Agency, is created. And within 10 years, they have uh, more than 12,000 cryptologists on contract. That's huge. 
Uh, then you've got, in 1965, the U.S. government builds the first data center, which can store 742 million tax returns and also 175 million sets of fingerprints. Now, this is pretty interesting here because this is this is something that was re- uh, recorded onto magnetic tape and computer tape. You may, I don't know if anybody listening would know what that is. Hopefully, maybe you've heard of this magnetic tape. My father is a controller, a controlling accountant. They have a uh, like a newer version of this magnetic tape, but uh-huh. it's still all of their stuff is backed up to this magnetic tape because it's so well, it's supposedly so reliable. Well, also, uh, people will recognize the magnetic tape if you've never seen it before. Um, every time you see an old computer with reels on it, that's yeah. magnetic tape. In uh, Captain America: The Winter Soldier, the sequel to the first Captain America. Uh, there is a scene, which I won't spoil for you if you haven't gotten around <laughs> to seeing it yet, but there is a scene which involves a gigantic computer, and that is magnetic tape. Awesome. Okay. Good reference. Now we understand. Uh, but there, here's the thing, though. This whole project was scrapped because of fears of, quote, Big Brother. Right. Being a little bit too Big Brotherish, a little Orwellian. Uh, so this, however changed everything because people were thinking, what if we centralize Mm -hmm. um, the location of data? You know, no more paper, just electronically store it. 1989, a British guy, some of you may have heard of, Tim Berners-Lee, invents what will go on to become the World Wide Web. And with this Boom! We're going like gangbusters because people are able to generate massive amounts of information, much more so than anybody could plausibly read. And know? when it's connected up to this uh, interweb, if you will, it can be it can be sent somewhere else, right? And then if you do have a data center, it doesn't matter where the data is collected; you can send it directly over there uh, almost immediately. Yeah, it's it's bizarre when we think about that, and especially when we think about um, how j- just let's have a John Henry moment. And can you compare Matt the the ability of a supercomputer to a person? Oh God, <laughs> can I? Hmm. Let's say okay. Let's say in 1995, the first supercomputer. Let's use that one as our example. It could do as much work in one second. Then a single human being operating a calculator could do in 30,000 years. 30,000 years. And that's not even the 21st century, ladies and gentlemen. Now we are at the modern age. In 2005, a guy from O'Reilly Media coined the term big data for the first time. Uh, and this was, you know, a successor to a, another less fortunate buzzword, which was Web 2.0. Yeah. Yeah. The, I, I still use that one. The new Coke <laughs> of web words. Uh, but yeah, so this this idea here is a little bit more combative, the idea of a data set that is just so massive and complex and interwoven that you can't use the traditional business intelligence tools to figure out what's going on, right? And 05 is also the year that Hadoop was created by Yahoo, which was built on the back of Google's MapReduce. And these are just uh, softwares that can basically take data from a, using a bunch of different computers to uh, crunch numbers, like <laughs> in huge amounts. Um, and it was the goal to index the entire, or, the entire World Wide Web. That's why these things were created. And uh, it's the open source Hadoop. It was used by a lot of organizations to crunch, crunch through data that just is, uh, it's almost inquantifiable how huge it is. Right. And this is not just a private industry thing, of course. And the line is blurry. We seem to talk about these two events in isolation as if the NSA using phone records and social media contacts, who do you know that knows who that knows who? On Facebook, right? Now you're on the list. Now you're on the list, right? Uh, they're, they're not just using that uh, and Target or another private mm-hmm. organization, um, a data broker. There are companies that just broker data. Uh, these do not exist in a vacuum. There's interplay between them, and uh, they're increasingly – merging to do just some amazing things. We're getting very, very good at seeing the present as never before. And other governments are involved in this as well. In 2009, the Indian government did something just 
ambitious is is like the most reasonable word for this. They decided to take an iris scan, fingerprint, and photo of everyone in India, every single person in India. There are so many people. Yes. Uh, can you imagine, listener, uh, if the government came to you and said, okay, we're going to need, uh, we're going to need an iris scan, a fingerprint, and we're also going to need a photograph, a really nicely framed photograph, uh, with good contrast. We're going to put it in of you and everyone in your family. Put it into this database. Don't worry. We're going to make sure it's secure and we're not going to use it for anything. Sure. But for good things. Promise. Right. Yeah. And that's 1.2 billion people this is two billion yeah this is the largest biometric database in the world uh so there's a great thing uh that eric schmidt from google also said right just another sense of perspective here yeah he he stated at the techonomy conference in lake tahoe he he stated quote there were five exabytes of information created by the entire world between the dawn of civilization and 2003 now that same amount is created every two days. Boom. Take, <sighs> take that history of the universe. I can't wait till the aliens land and say uh, that they're like, wow, these guys figured out how to make uh, pizza into burritos and there's a blog about it. <laughs> it's sort of like uh, when, you know, when people in modern times find uh, ancient Greek or Roman or African ruins from these empires of bygone days. And there's always some jerk, like hundreds of years ago, who wrote, like, Tim was here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, always. And true, like Dick Butt from Reddit. And they're just like, huh, that is a precursor right there. Right. So uh, there's, but there's so much information being made. And, you know, I'm being a little crass here, but the point I'm hoping to make is that. This information is not, you know, noble stuff or even stuff that would really make sense to a human being who didn't know what they were looking for. These are metrics. These are movements. These are little breadcrumbs of you scattered around the Internet at large. And then you're just bringing them together to make another picture. It's like pointillism, really. That's a wonderful, wonderful image. Yeah, that's really good. Um, everything you do online today or in any electronic medium is recorded by somebody. Yep. If you're typing on a keyboard or on a touchpad, it's getting recorded. So enjoy it. Unle hey, unless you're on an air gapped computer, and we've all learned now what that is. <laughs> so, okay. So uh, let's just uh, – another example here. Uh, fortunately – for some of us, I'm not going to name names, but for some of us, it is not a crime to be drunk on the Internet. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, okay, sure. And there are people who, you know, have maybe in a fit of passion or maybe they had some drinks and they, they wrote something crazy on the Internet and they almost sent it. And they said, no, wait, I'm going to sleep on this. Let me think about this before I write anything. Well, those ghost movements, those drafts that you make are also part of this. So just the act of typing, especially in Facebook. Oh, you know? yeah, don't ghost draft in Facebook. Right, yeah. And all of these pieces of information assemble, again, that's such a beautiful image, Matt, a, a pointillist portrait of you and who you are. And the big worry that a lot of people have, and we see it through sci-fi and pop culture, and, and we've seen this for decades, is that this will be able to go beyond just a... Um, a panoply view of the present or a panopticon kind of view of the present to become predictive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So eventually you just have an understanding of what each one of these people is going to do throughout their daily lives, what uh, what the corporation is going to profit from in the next two, three years. You can – I mean, I, it's crazy to imagine all the information that we will eventually be able to get from this big data. Right. And whose hands will it be in? Well, and, and who can who can accurately understand this? So we, we also talk about these controversies. This stuff is around to stay mm -hmm. until the lights go out on humanity. Yeah. This, this stuff will be around to stay. Oh, yeah. It is here to stay unless there's some kind of weird fight club moment and all the buildings holding all the stuff, the data centers blow up, which... 
uh, is probably not going to happen. There's really right. good security at those buildings. Right, and it's a distributed network, so it would be hard to take the the head off. It would be hard to take all of the heads off the Hydra. Yeah, that is the information age. Uh, of course, this doesn't come without controversy. We have we have a video about four creepy things about big data or this umbrella term, which can again apply to government as well as industry. It can learn big data can be used to learn your secrets. It's scary. So if you think. Uh, nobody knows that you routinely order three large cheese pizzas with ham and sit in the dark in your house at 2 a.m. every Thursday night eating and crying. Nope, sorry. Watching it, reruns of Firefly. Watching reruns of Firefly. Nope, sorry. Somebody knows. Papa John's knows. Yeah. Uh, Comcast probably knows. Comcast probably knows. <laughs> Maybe Netflix. Yeah. Uh, so, the uh, it, another thing, it doesn't have to tell you what it knows. There oh, is yeah. a surprising lack of transparency on the part of companies collecting your information. Yeah, uh, that uh, what is the name of that company? Axiom. Axiom. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They're scary, huh? Dude, uh, dude, yeah. yeah I, I've been. We we're making this video, and uh, the way it works is usually Ben will Ben will write uh, an outline for what he's going to present in the vlog. I will shoot it. Then as I'm editing, I end up doing a lot of research. And oh my God, Ben, I've just been scouring their website and mm. nothing against you, Axiom, if you're listening, your sure. employees. Um, it's just a murky world. Well, it's pervasive. Like the, the amount of information that Axiom has is, is impressive. Yeah. And, and the way they talk about it sometimes, their offline data that they have, used for online purposes. Yeah. I don't know. It's fascinating if you go to the website. So we, we've we talked a little bit about just the, the science fiction elements and how we see some science fact generating, but we do know that this is a very old story. We've seen things like Isaac Asimov's Foundation series, which deal with the fictional, at this point, fictional science of psychohistory, predicting the future on a large scale event. We've dealt with Gattaca, where uh, personal information, medical information is used to, gosh, I'm, I'm trying not to spoil things. You know? <laughs> I know it's tough. Yeah, but I mean, what's the limit with spoilers? Like, at, at what point? It kind of stinks. I, I, I guess you just have to put an alert at the very beginning of something that might have a spoiler in it and just say, don't listen to this if you have not seen these movies, read these books, or listened to these songs. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's pretty – okay. <laughs> All right. So that's that's pretty complicated. But we've also seen it in, of course, Minority Report, which yep. we mentioned. Uh, but the, the controversy surrounding this, which is expressed in our culture, is uh, – oh, oh, and another one would be uh, The Dark Knight. Oh, yes. Yeah, we're uh, Lucius Fox. Okay. Yeah, uh, and the uh, cell phone system, monitoring mm -hmm. system. So uh, we see we see this expressed in the culture of um, multiple nations, but what what's the real stuff? What's the real controversy? Could could it damage your credit report if you had GPS data that said you were I don't know, going to a pawn shop often or something, you know? Yeah, I, I don't know. And that's, I don't want to scare anybody. That's a, <laughs> that's a made up example there. But we do know that the, um, we do know that the possibilities for that kind of stuff, again, just possibilities are there. And then I love that you pointed out the other side of the argument, which is, well, maybe this is more, Convenient. Maybe this is the way things should be. Uh, it's a personalized experience for me wherever I go. Yeah, I, it's certainly sold to us that way, and I think maybe some people buy that. I, I am unfortunately somewhere in the middle. I don't know if you asked for my opinion, Ben, but guess what? I'm giving what? it. What? Oh, uh, I, <laughs> I, I fall somewhere in the middle where I, I appreciate what the I appreciate the attempt of what's trying to happen. But ultimately, really, the bottom line is that these companies are trying to make a profit by targeting. Sure. Right? And yeah. that's the way you sell things nowadays. We're so inundated with advertising mm. that the only real way to get a message across is to send it with an arrow straight at your eyeball mm -hmm. in your ear. Like, uh, Hi, Super Producer Noel Brown. We understand that uh, you have recently begun working with a Moog. Here are some products that might interest you. 
Exactly. I mean, that's the only way you're going to do it now. But uh, yeah, that's that's probably true, man. But I personally, my biggest concern about this this encroaching analysis, uh, my biggest concern is that it can function as a kind of inherent censorship due to like the search bubble. They, uh, oh, that's the idea huge. that based on your past search history, you only receive results that are quote unquote relevant to you. I don't want to receive the results that are relevant to me. I want to see both sides of any argument. I want to see um, news that would be in another language. There's going to be some kind of college course that shows you how to get the most balanced uh, Google search results. And it'll yeah. all it'll be an entire course that just shows you how to develop <laughs> over time by searching for certain things at certain mm-hmm. times. Well, there are things like Scroogle and DuckDuckGo that are supposed to not track your search. There are places to go currently. But, mm-hmm. you know, it, we've seen as acquisitions continue and certain corporations continue to get more and more monolithic, uh, mm-hmm. I can see a future where there is one place to search for things. Well, and, and there's also this idea that that I think is tremendously positive, e- even noble almost, that if we had enough data and if we had enough sophisticated parsing algorithms or software, then we might be able to address global problems that ordinarily wouldn't have been able to be solved. Like what if there were a way to uh, stop the massive extinction of Earth's wildlife, right? That- Agreed. And that's amazing. And I love that view. Mm-hmm. But conversely, yeah. you could also, with that same data, stomp out all and every form of resistance against a certain movement. That's true. Right. And uh, this this becomes a matter of, uh, I don't know, sh- the short term stuff versus the long term problems. Absolutely. So with that being said, let's go straight to the crazy stuff. Okay. The conspiracy is both theoretical and factual. Uh, there's a the there's a this theory of uh, troubling possibility, the kind of thing that uh, a sci-fi writer would make a dystopian novel about, that uh, we could eventually arrive at a world in which circumstance and accident has fallen to the statistical hand of fate and certitude, so that. Something very much like an artificial god knows how you will live your days from the cradle to the grave. Yeah. I don't like that, Ben. It's a scary thing. There is some silver lining here, though. Uh, There are many competitors right now in this Mm. space. There's not just one big data Right. Company. Right. Um, so at least, you know, much in the same way that there are shadowy forces trying to control the world, there are a lot of them. There's not just one group. Yeah, and, and they uh, these groups might not necessarily work together, especially if they're competing in a private sphere, right? Not unless it's, you know, helpful for the bottom line. Right. They gather their data sets and, and uh, they guard their techniques pretty jealously. Also, here's the one thing. When we talk about this super all-knowing Wizard of Oz type computer, the fact of the matter is that we still apparently can't build a computer that can predict the weather. No, because there, there's always with the weather. There's always that, um, I don't know that chaos factor almost to where uh-huh. you can't. There's so it's so complex. All of the different moving parts that create the weather. But, but it's, Ben, yeah. what? Yeah, I guess it would be. I guess the same would be true for big data. There's so many different moving parts that it's so complex. Yeah, it seems like it would be. I don't know. Is it easier to build something that can predict the weather or something that can predict the passage of time in a country, you know? Yeah. Uh, we've talked before off air about this and, and maybe on air too, but, uh, we, you know, I had a professor, uh, a long time ago in a different life who was working with DARPA to build an artificial model of a country with, yeah. with the idea that if they programmed enough data points, together and assign them to these individuals, then they could measure, kind of like foundation in real life, they could measure the likelihood of trends, you know, like uh, if if police, uh, if support for police goes up by X percent, uh, what will be the effect upon the livelihood or the likelihood of the regime's collapse or stability? And I don't know where he went with it, but it is some amazing 
terrifying and inspiring stuff. Either way, he can't talk about it anymore, I'm sure. <laughs> right. And this, and still, at least to our knowledge, listeners, uh, mm-hmm. this remains a theoretical thing, but it is a fact that uh, big business is doing stuff like this all the time and not necessarily, you know, it's not like there's somebody out there just rubbing their hands together, super villain style, uh, waiting for you to slip so they can, you know, tell tell your mom that you are smoking cigarettes or something. <laughs> yeah. You know, they're what. What it is more about is is um, not immoral, but amoral um, providing of a better service or being a better um, service to the consumer. But now consumers are increasingly the product as well, right? Exactly. Your information is the thing, the commodity, which is so weird. Information is commodity. I guess it's been coming for a long time, and it has been that way for a long time. Mm-hmm. It's just strange to think about it on this scale. It's almost like... The information, what I'm seeing it is the access and ability to collect massive amounts of information is this new gold rush thing. Ah, that's good. Yeah, you're killing it with the comparisons. Well, I don't know. That's just what I'm seeing. We're all Mm -hmm. these large corporations that are building, you know, massive supercomputer complexes of supercomputers that can just crunch numbers, man. Mm -hmm. Ugh. Well, we're, but we're at a point where you know, there could be some positives for this if if it was uh, able to, if these data sets were able to, for instance, help humanity combat, I don't know, overfishing or help uh, humanity co- uh, figure out the best way to prevent mass starvation or disease. But again, you know, the, those things are also, they seem to be more complex than weather patterns. They They are, and I just, it's hard for me to imagine someone looking at those problems and making a profit from it or, you know, devising a way to make a profit from it and use all these assets mm-hmm. in order to do something good. I, I'm i sorry, man. My faith in humanity just, like, got ticked down a couple notches for some reason in thinking about all this stuff because this is all – really what we're talking about here are ways to sell things, ah. right? That's what this whole thing is about. Well, what I I would say what I feel like what we're talking about is is a little bit further than that. It's ways to predict future events. So selling something okay. is trying to predict what will trigger a purchase, right? So yes. it's it's still predictive or hopefully predictive. Um but the the question though right now and the answer it seems is that uh overall while we know that people are working fervently to build a machine that can read the future, right? Mm-hmm. A, a modern day fortune teller. Uh, we, we do not yet have that oracle, at least in the public sphere. We don't know about it, but we do know that people are working on it. And that brings us to, um, I guess one of the, the things we can close with today, huh? Yeah, a little something called anomaly detection at multiple scales, or atoms. It's uh, brought to you by DARPA, friends over at DARPA. Uh, Good people. Um, They work hard over at DARPA. So this comes directly from the DARPA website. And I'm just going to read you this quote. It's a little long. Bear with me. Quote, The anomaly detection at multiple scales, or atoms, program, creates, adapts, and applies technology to anomaly characterization and detection in massive data sets. Anomalies in data cue the collection of additional, actionable information in a wide variety of real-world contexts. The initial application domain is insider threat detection, in which malevolent, or possibly inadvertent, actions by a trusted individual are detected against a background of everyday network activity. So they're looking, they're looking at a person, a, a trusted insider person. Mm-hmm. And, and then they are going, oh, well, here is an anomalous action or an anomalous piece of data inside this sure. other data set. Sure. Like, uh, Mrs. Cunningham works for a Wall Street investment firm mm-hmm. and every day Mrs. Cunningham has lunch at 12:30 and goes back to work until 6:30 at which point she leaves and it takes her an hour and a half to get home because of traffic and then one day she goes to lunch but instead of going to a restaurant 
she goes down to, you know, um, a gun store or she goes to a, you know, her, her anomalies change. Right. Yeah. Or she seems to be in closer contact with a competitor. So they could, they could call these anomalies. And we've, we've heard people talk about this sometimes. Like if you haven't checked out the website Zero Hedge, that's a, oh, man. it's a very interesting read and it's well done. Uh, one of the things that they've talked about before is anomaly detection and these theories about, you know, um, market, uh, forces or investor actions right before a uh, calamitous event. Oh, yeah. There's some great analysis of that stuff by Tyler Durden, <laughs> actually, speaking of Fight Club. Yes, yes. Uh, so, what? I, okay, this is part of one, one of the things I wanted to ask you about. Have you heard the theory that um, not only is Tyler Durden not real, but the, the girlfriend character is not real either? No. That it's another person he made up? Oh, wow. Now, okay. Oh, wow. Okay, I'm trying to... Just check it out. Just Google it. It has, <laughs> it has nothing to do with what we're talking about now. Uh, but we do want to hear from you, not just with your Fight Club theories, but send them if you want. I think it's an interesting movie. Oh, I do, too. It... I, I won't go into some of the plot hole parts. It's cool. <laughs> All right. Well, let us know what, what you think about it. But more importantly, let us know what you think about big data. Is it possible to get off of the grid? How difficult is it? What do you think, um, what do you think people are doing with all this information in the public and private sphere? One of the big concerns that we hear a lot about is the idea that the surveillance state, at least in the U.S. and the West, has grown because, um, the intelligence agencies and departments are able to use the dirt they have on the elected officials to prevent the elected officials from, uh, you know, slowing the growth of the yeah. surveillance state. The idea of a deep state or a shadow government. Okay, so to make me feel better, please send in your suggestions like Ben had earlier of positive things that could be used, that big data could be used for. Please, please send those to us just to make me feel better. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And that's the end of this classic episode. If you have any thoughts or questions about this episode, you can get into contact with us in a number of different ways. One of the best is to give us a call. Our number is 1-833-STDWYTK. If you don't want to do that, you can send us a good old-fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iheartradio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.